we just always underestimate both how capable and adaptable the children can be. And if we give them that opportunity, they, they, they never stop surprising us. So try it, you know, go for a, a shorter day hike. You know, if, if, if you think, or oh, they, can, they can probably do two or three miles, make it five, but be prepared to bail it four. Episode 288, Robert and Hazel Jones talk about through hiking the West Highland Way in Scotland with their three children. Support for the Adventure Sports Podcast comes from Kind Snacks. Go check them out at kindsnacks.com slash adventure. There you'll get a 10 snack variety pack for just 10 bucks with free shipping. They'll send you some dark chocolate nuts and sea salt, some roasted jalapeno almond bars, and some of my favorite, my new favorites, are the mango apple chia pressed bars. So check them out and let them know we sent you by going to kindsnacks.com slash adventure. This episode is sponsored by Health IQ. If you're exercising regularly, don't you think you deserve a special rate on life insurance? Find out how much you can save by taking the health quiz for your adventure sport at healthiq.com slash adventure. A few minutes on their site could save you a bunch on your life insurance. Get rewarded for all your hard work at healthiq.com slash adventure. You're listening to the Adventure Sports Podcast brought to you by 180 Tech. We talk with adventurers from around the globe to bring you the inspiration and motivation you need to get started in the outdoors or to keep you moving if you're already there. Now here's your host, Kurt Linville. Hi friends. Thank you again for listening to the Adventure Sports Podcast. This is Kurt. I have a really fun interview for you today. I have a couple out of the Isle of Wight in the UK who recently hiked 96 miles on the West Highland Way in Scotland with their three children, ages five, seven, and nine. And so I am excited to hear how that went, a family backpacking trip in Scotland. Robert Jones and Hazel Jones are on the horn. Welcome to the Adventure Sports Podcast. Hey, Kat. Hi, Kat. How are you? Hi. Well, we're excited to have you here. And will you introduce your children to us? Yes, right. Hi, we've got Evan. Say hi, Evan. Hi. How old are you, Ev? Nine. And we've got Lil. Say hi, Lil. Hi. How old are you, Lil? Seven. And Isaac. Say hi, Isaac. Hi. How old are you? And I'm five. You're five. Oh, that's great. It's good to meet you. Let's start with Evan. Evan, how did you like the trip? Did you enjoy hiking? Yeah. Was it a long walk? Oh, yeah, you bet. So did you get very, very tired? Yep. And <laughs> was it more fun or more work, do you think? I think it was more fun. Oh, good. I love it. So, Lil, what do you think? Did you enjoy the hike? Yeah. Did you have as much fun as you thought you might when you were planning the trip? Yes. Did you like sleeping in the tent? Yes. Were the views nice? Yes. Oh, that's great. And Isaac, did you enjoy the hike too? Yeah. How long were you out there? A really long time? 96. (laughs) <laughs> 96 miles. Yeah, not 96 days, 96 miles. <laughs> so how many days was it, Hazel? It was um, 10 days. 10 days we were hiking. 10. 10 days. So you guys were doing some good distance. Yeah, we left loads of time for hiking, didn't we? But we did it super fast. Wow, you guys were really going fast then. Do you know that we did Glencoe, which is just before King's House, straight to Kenneth Leatham? Was that a really long day? Yes. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I am so glad that you guys, as a family, that you got to go do this hike together. You'll make memories that way. And for years to come, you'll be able to talk about the time that we went hiking. So that's wonderful. What was your favorite bit, Evan? I forgot. Oh, what about you, Devil's <laughs> Staircase. Devil's Staircase. What was your favorite bit, Isa? Glencoe. Why did you like Glencoe so much? Because we had a perfect view of a scrambling bit. Ooh. A super scrambly bit. And we did see snow at Glencoe. It snowed big fat flakes of snow, didn't it? Yeah. Wow. It didn't settle. That was in the spring. Oh, look, do you want to tell Kurt what you've got in front of you? Because he can't see it. We've got... A passport. So on the West Highland Way, you can get a passport. And, and at each different point on the trail, you get a different stamp. And oh, that's fun. Like all the stamps. We've in got, it, apart from the first one, because there's no one there. Mill Guys. Dev Mill Guys. 
So how many stamps is it? How many stamps are there, Ray? There are 12. I mean, <laughs> 13. I'm getting stuff right. out of Well, it's nearly your guys' bedtime, isn't it? Cause it's, it's getting late for small people in the UK here. Did you, is there anything else you wanted to tell Kurt before you go to bed? No. No. Right, what do you say then? Say night-night. That was that Bye. Good night, kiddos. Thank you for letting us hear your voices and sharing with us. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs> That's fun. There they go. All in their pajamas. <laughs> so I have to ask how you came up with the idea of doing the West Highland Way, and especially with your kids at these ages. I mean, they're pretty young to be doing that kind of distance. That's impressive. Yeah, well, if we back up a bit, a couple of years ago, we um, decided to bite the bullet and we'll go up Mount Snowden. Which um, I thought was lunacy, really, because um, Isaac was like, only just four? Yeah, he just turned four. Um, Snowden is uh, the highest mountain in Wales. It's about 3,000 feet. Wow. Um, but there's actually a train that goes to the top. Yeah, so I was happy for him to do it because we knew that if we got stuck, we could get the train. Right. So that was fine. And, yeah, so on that, that was our first trip to the mountains with the children and basically they ran to the top That's yeah right. and we, we couldn't keep up and that kind of opened our eyes to their capabilities and what they probably could do so after a, a few a, well a few really good hill days and trips to the mountains we decided to take on a bit of a bigger adventure we thought they were more than capable and yeah it was probably one of the best things we've ever done oh how how cool and they love it. I mean, Isaac, every time he meets new people, he tells them that his favourite thing is, is scrambling. It's just, what's he, what, his birthday's coming up, and for his birthday, he wants to go. He wants to go climbing with his daddy. It's oh. Snowden again, does Well, that's fun. You know, kids do love being outside, and they love being with their parents. And when you can combine the two, then it really does have a, a lot of wonderful opportunities. I've noted that some kids, when they're younger... Um, they would rather kind of stay put and experience nature on a smaller scale. They're they're all about the insects and the flowers and and finding places to hide and build little nests and things like that. Um, but some kids really like to hike. They like to move on out. And it sounds like your children really do enjoy the movement, the hiking. Yeah, it, it seems to be the harder the trail, the uh, easier they find it. You know, if it's just a, a flat track through the woods they struggle and they slip into dawdle mode quite quickly but if it's rocky or boggy they'll just sprint on ahead of us and we struggle to keep up yeah there was one point on the west Highland way i mean it was beautiful we were going through these big tall pine forests weren't we but it was like a a sunday walk like a walk that would end in a puff it did end in a puff but isaac the youngest isaac he's five he slowed to like toddler speed and it took how long did it take us to do that section it was we did about four miles in nearly six hours. <laughs> he kind of crazy. lost interest. Yeah, we really did. But then, then we got we got to the pub and we were very close to to giving it all up. But then we met someone that we'd seen um, on at various points along the way, and she was called Emma, wasn't she? Yeah. And and she told us that that us hiking with the kids was so inspirational that she was going to carry on herself because she had these massive blisters all over her feet and a pack that was like literally three times the size of her. Wow. And she was like, I'm going to go home when I finish. I'm going to, oh, she was French. I am going to go home. I can't do a French accent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go home. I'm going to phone my boyfriend. We're going to start a family because of you and I will finish this trail. And then off she marched. So we thought we'd give it, you know, we'd give it another go and see if Isaac could speed up a bit. And then we went on the next section and it was... It got trickier. It was a lot more up and down and jumping over boulders. And yeah, we, you know, it was half past four in the afternoon and we were looking for somewhere to camp for the evening, but we just couldn't keep up with him. We just kept going. He ran the next bit. It was amazing. So it sounds like the the children really like the distraction of stuff to scramble over. That's cool. Yeah, they'll always find the hardest route possible. Wow. Yeah, they they will. And Isaac, he's a bit like spider-man something like jump boulder to boulder which it's quite terrifying to watch sometimes but But that's the way (laughs) that children are going to be and i have to 
confide that's the way I am too. I love to scramble over the rocks. I think it's so much fun. So uh, once again, let's go back and talk about this trail a little bit so that our listeners have some context. So it was a 96-mile trip, and you said you did it in 10 days? Um, yeah, it runs from, the West Highland Way itself runs from just outside Glasgow at a place called Mulgai, um, and it goes up alongside Loch Lomond and then up through various glens and valleys through, through the mountains rather than up and over the mountains uh, up to Fort William in the north. And most people, adults, would take maybe five or six, maybe seven days to do the trip. Um, but because it was the school Easter holidays and I had managed to get the time from my work, we had two weeks to do the whole trip. So we had a, a good buffer zone should it take us a bit longer. Right. Um, and our, I think our goal was really about eight miles a day. That yeah, would give us two days for traveling and then 12 days actually hiking. But you did a little bit so better than that, right? We Oh, we did a lot better. Better. We ended up, well, it took us 10 days to get to Fort William, but we did take a rest day uh, just outside Glencoe on the way up just to let the kids' feet recover. And there was a big snowstorm forecast as well. So we hid from that for a day. At chips for a day, didn't we? <laughs> Caught up on the calories. So what was the time of year when you did this? What were the dates? Um, we went over Easter, so it was the uh, first two weeks of April this year, if I remember rightly. Um, and I'm a self-employed gardener, so that's one of my quiet, well, I say it's a quieter time of year for me. It, things haven't really got started, so it's really, the, it's really the only time in the year I can afford to take two weeks off at once. Is the weather in Scotland that time of the year uh, a good, is it good, or it sounds a little early? Um, yeah, we, but, we um, kind of had all the weather. We had lovely sunny days, um, which at one point every day it rained. Um, we had minus two or three degrees Celsius the, the funny nights. It was though the kids for their homework over Easter had to do a weather diary. So when they oh, had to get go. in, their teachers were like, "Where have you been? There's been hail and snow." And was, <laughs> none of that here on the yeah, island. Yeah, we did have all the weather. Yeah. We had a um, seven, seven rainbow day, didn't we? Yeah, we had one day with seven rainbows, which is wow. quite nice. Um, but the other benefit of going early is that we were pre-midge, because oh, yeah. up on the west coast of Scotland, you've probably heard about the West Highland midge, and it's just vicious, and it will just come after you. It's smaller than a mosquito, but it will just annoy you and bite you all the time. And they usually hatch out towards the end of May. So we thought, well, we might be a bit cold and a bit wet, but we're not going to be harassed and bitten by all these midges. And it worked out very well. It sounds like your kids had a wonderful time. They were so they excited did, yeah. about it. <laughs> They're still excited about it now. It was it was amazing. It really was a trip of the life of a lifetime because we're never going to get that uninterrupted time with them at that age, like ever again. Because it was just it was just walking and sleeping. So. It was just amazing. And the scenery in Scotland, it's beautiful. Well, Hazel, will you describe that scenery a little bit for the listeners who aren't familiar with it? Uh, was it forested? Was it rolling green hills? Or was it a little bit of everything? It was everything. It was like walking in different places each day. So it, the start was, um, was it was in a town. And you go through, and it, it was a bit urban, and then it was like lots of people. We saw so many dogs. There's um, have so, you heard of Harry Mac, Harry McLary of Donaldson's Dairy? No, no, it's a children's book, and it's all about different dogs. And we spot and it's different types of dogs, and they they chase Harry McLary until this big tomcat scares them away. But there were different <laughs> kind of kind of dogs. So we had lots of dog waters. So we saw Bottomley Pots. He's a sausage dog, like Big Dane. So we had fun naming all the dogs. So that was all like, like you were still close to civilization, and then we went into the locks, and they were just beautiful. And you're like up in the hills, and you could see the locks. You could see where the was it the tectonic. Yeah, you can see the fault line. The fault line with different hills in it, and the, the sunshine reflected on on the, this beautiful lock that just went on for miles and miles and miles. And then, and you've got the beachy bits, and you walk along the lock, and then you go through, and then you're up into the mountains. And it was just beautiful. Yeah, it, 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 it kind of felt that every couple of the days the, the scenery just sort of changed. So the first couple of the days, you're definitely in the Scottish lowlands, if you yeah. like, which is 
farmland and pasture and then and you've got another couple of days where well for us it was a couple of days uh where you're alongside the lock and it's heavily forested and it's lots of pines and then occasional sections of oaks and birches and then you get oh, up waterfalls. in waterfalls so many waterfalls yeah the, the next the next section it feels sort of well like sheep country really you get up a bit higher and you know the land is really only good for running sheep and then it's just the that, colors yeah. are all kind of golden and, and yeah and lovely don't you imagine that at the time of year we went it was um oh, just like a, you imagine a romantic painting but you imagine that different time of years it, it would change the colors would change as you went through the landscape but it was spectacular wasn't it yeah especially the last couple of the days where you get into like the for us, the really big mountains up and around, oh, yeah. well, the approach to Ben Nevis, really, and the mummers. Touch them, you were right up there, like with the gods. It was beautiful. Oh, and we had this one bit where um, we were near the Bridge of Orkey, which Isaac named the Bridge of Yorkie, but you probably don't know what a Yorkie bar is. No. No, it, it's a chocolate bar that we were eating. <laughs> you know, I know what Ben <laughs> Nevis is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was a good pun for a five year old. I have to throw but, this out there. My uh, my son just got a border collie this spring, a border collie puppy, and he decided oh. to name him Nevis after that Excellent. peak. Oh, I love yeah. that. So <laughs> our new border collie is named Nevis. It's a good name for a dog. Yeah, yeah. Like why not? It. Especially because the border collie originated from that area. So why not? That's great. <laughs> but um, yeah, when we were in the Bridge of Orkey, yeah, it was raining so much and we got so wet and so miserable and then we we had we had to wild camp because there was nowhere else to camp so we camped under these big pine trees oh and you shared your food didn't you because yeah. someone had managed to not buy enough yeah food, I, so. I, I should probably go back to the start of that day because that was actually quite a momentous day for the trip um yeah that was kind of a turning point wasn't it yeah um so we, we decided we'd just have an early day uh, an early finish and we walked into uh where were we uh, yeah, we'd come out of the woods the previous night and found somewhere to camp. And the next day, we decided that we were just going to walk two or three miles up to the next village and just have an early day and have a rest and then let, let the kids recuperate and then go on. Um, but because of all the rain we had had the previous night, the campground there was flooded out. Wow. So we, deci- we decided we'd just keep on going. We'll find somewhere in the trees to pitch up for the night. We wouldn't need to go too far. And it was... a it was now a beautiful day um, and we kept going. Uh, we had people on the road, which was running parallel to the trail at this point, were honking at us because they could, you know, in their cars because they could see the kids and wishing us luck. You know, you know, we were in really good spirits um, going underneath Ben Doran, which is this beautiful mountain. It's got like the its slope is almost the perfect curve. It's, it's beautiful. If people want to Google Ben Doran, Oh, it's the most beautiful mountain I've ever seen. Wow. Um, and we were just underneath that, and the weather changed, and it came in sideways. It does that uh, in Scotland. And um, within minutes, our waterproofs were useless. We were wet rain. through. Hazel had taken Evan, I believe, and it was striding out to try and find some shelter, so much so that she couldn't, well, the storm was going so bad that she couldn't hear me shouting her to slow up. Um, we finally got to the end of that section where there was a little hotel where we managed to go in and get warmed up. Um, but Quietly drip in a corner. That's right. And um, <laughs> yeah, we were just soaking wet, freezing cold. We ended up pitching the tent in a, in a pine plantation with three or four other hikers who had been caught out by the weather. And it was just a case of get the kids in the tent in, the, in some dry clothes and make some hot chocolate for them wow. so, so so they're sat in the tent you know nice and warm in their sleeping bags already they, they're getting nice and dry and i'm outside huddled around this stove trying to make the hot chocolate getting colder <laughs> and colder <laughs> right. and colder and it was perfect hypothermia conditions really sure. in, and yeah we were just a little bit worried um and then one of the chaps from the other camp behind us came over they had been caught out and didn't have enough food and did we have any spare food so we donated a pasta snack or two and some oat cakes to their cause because 
with the children we always carry plenty of food um and yeah we decided then that if it was still raining in the morning we were going to walk back to this little village we'd come through and get the train and we didn't know if we were going to give it up entirely and just get the train to Fort William or get the train back to Tindrum to and redo that section but we decided if it was wet in the morning we weren't walking on and when we woke up in the morning it was I, w- I wouldn't say it was dry but it wasn't raining quite as bad as it was no it wasn't. and the wind was blowing and by the time we had packed up the tent it was just a few light spots and we thought well the wind might dry us and so we decided to push on for an hour and if it came on heavy rain again we'd turn back Oh, and the poor kids' boots, we hadn't been yeah. able to dry them. Cause we couldn't, the, yeah, the kids no had wet boots, <laughs> wet coats. They were all really quite not happy it about being soggy. It sounds very soggy, very soggy. It was, it was very wet, you know. Um, yeah, but the benefit of it was all the rain we had the night before on the tops of the mountains had fallen as snow. So we just had these beautiful white tops all around mm. us. And after walking for an hour, the wind had dried us off. We um, were in good spirits it, again, it, and we just motored on. But as, as we... Because you couldn't see the whole snow-covered mountains as you were walking until you got like over this this little hillock, didn't you? And then it was jaw-droppingly beautiful because of all the heavy rain. It was just just spectacular. And then the the clouds rolled black, and it was like blue sky and, and white mountains. And the kids were just just running and laughing. And yeah, I, it, part part of our uh, or part of my worries about carrying on that morning was we the next section was Rannoch Moor which is quite notorious in the guidebook is one of the tougher sections and it turned out not to be the case at all I mean I don't think I'd want to be up there in awful weather but we think you know the guidebook says all you need to be careful because you can lose the track but we we found it really quite nice going and with the snow on the mountain tops and then you come round at the end into Glencoe and it was it was just fantastic it was beautiful Wow. So isn't that something I have found that when you run away from the weather, and sometimes that's smart, but when you run away from the weather, you often miss those magical experiences because it's like the weather brings the magic to nature, right? And so you got to see the snow on the peaks and experience it on that whole new level. Had the weather just been beautiful the whole time, it may have been a totally different experience. Yeah, we certainly wouldn't have got the snow. But I think part of doing a trip like this with the children is you know having that ability to to persevere despite well, no actually I, I think it's more important to know that if you need to bail there's there's nothing wrong with that no. you know it, we, we want to be responsible parents at the end of the day while we're right. doing these sort of things with the kids so that morning if we woken up and it was still raining we would have been on that train I don't have a date about that and I think uh, fortune just came our way with a break in the weather that we were able to carry on long enough to get dry. But we're never too too proud to bail on a trip if it, if it, if we think it's getting too dangerous or too much for the children, you know? Sure. I think you have to allow for that. But it's neat that you got to uh, have that weather window and experience it like that. Very, very cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's good for them to get completely soaking and know that that's not the, the end of the world to experience some discomfort. So once they were tucked into their sleeping bag, sipping hot chocolate in the tent, were they just happy as could be? Yeah, no, they were. Yeah, fine. they were fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Except for Dad. Dad's out Except there in me. the storm. <laughs> wow. Hey, friends, Kurt here. You know, we might have the healthiest audience of any podcast on the planet. I don't know. It it, it just seems to me that people that are out there doing adventure sports have to be pretty healthy. They appreciate being healthy, and they love to get out there and move. And we recently got a new sponsor, Health IQ, and they reward people who love to be healthy. This is cool stuff. So do you exercise five times a week? If so, then you probably think you deserve a different rate on your life insurance. You're not the smoker. You're not the one who's out there abusing his or her body and and having a lot of health issues that result. Instead, you're out there moving and eating right and doing right things. So shouldn't your premiums be lower? Health IQ uses science and data to secure special rates on life insurance for health-conscious people 
like cyclists, runners, strength trainers, vegans, and more. Matter of fact, research shows that those who frequently exercise with some intensity have a 22% lower cancer risk, a 56% lower heart disease risk, and up to a 34% lower risk of an early death. So why not get rewarded for that? Historically, you get penalized for your family history, body mass index, and other attributes, but you don't get rewarded for your health-conscious lifestyle. Well, Health IQ does reward you for your health-conscious lifestyle with special rates on life insurance. How cool is that? To get more information and a free quote, Go to healthiq.com forward slash adventure and make sure you do use that forward slash adventure that makes sure that they know where you heard about them on the Adventure Sports Podcast. So healthiq.com forward slash adventure. Well, let's talk about how you carried your gear because that's a challenge when you have children along who maybe can't carry that 40 pound pack, right? Wow. Oh, yeah, the carrying the gear is the hardest bit, I think. Yeah, we had... Especially when we started off. Yeah, we when we first started off, we were definitely carrying too, too much. much stuff. Yeah. We had one... I don't know what weights we were carrying. It was heavy. Um, but I started off with a 85-litre rucksack, which was filled to bursting. Hazel had a 65-litre rucksack. I think because we were with the kids, we just wanted to pack for, like, every single thing that they could possibly be had those are that. huge packs <laughs> that is massive, yeah, massive. we're european aren't we? we, we we're famed in america for <laughs> us europeans for having big packs <laughs> uh, i have mine i called my name bertha and she was horrid and i just carried her we got off the train and we had to walk a little bit to the first campsite and i was like oh, i can't do this for 96 miles <laughs> i was like nearly falling over backwards like some kind of turtle just we did manage to slim things down a little bit within a phase. Well, by the third day, I think we had our and we swapped. Backpacks. Yeah, we swapped backpacks as well. Hazel went on the with the bigger backpack, but with less stuff in it because it just felt com- the other backpack felt comfier on me. Um, yeah, and we made the children carry a little bit more than we originally planned. So uh, uh, Evan was a hero. He kept getting high fives on the trail for carrying a pack. Yeah, so (laughs) Evan's our oldest. He's not. He he was nine when we did the trip, and he had my. uh, He borrowed my twenty-five liter rucksack, and he carried all the children's sleeping bags and his spare clothes. He's a real little trooper. He was brilliant, and by by the end of it, when we got to Fort William, there was a play park, and he could do the monkey bars, and he was so excited because he'd never been able to do it before. Ah, so he got a lot stronger. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. yeah. Yeah. Oh, how rewarding. That's so much fun. However, I have just ordered a new backpack and I've gone for a much smaller one. So I'm thinking, um, you know, if it doesn't fit in the bag, I can't carry it. So it won't be quite so hard on my back. Right. Definitely overpacked on the food as well. Yeah. It was really easy to get food along the way. And and there was some trail magic as well as we went. So, yeah. Yeah. When we set off, um, we were carrying five days worth of food because with it being the Easter holidays and rural Scotland, we weren't sure about just where we'd be able to resupply. Um, We knew there was a shop at Cree and Larrick, which we were hoping to hit on the Thursday after leaving on the Sunday, um, because the Friday was Good Friday and we weren't sure if it would be open on the Friday. So we kind of marched to this little shop, (laughs) but we're hiking past um, campsites with well-stocked shops in bed and breakfasts and hotels yeah, where you can get meals and we really and... <laughs> we really didn't need to car- we really didn't need to carry all that food but i think part of it is because we haven't got all the money in the world and it was much cheaper for us to you know buy stuff in our local supermarket at home and carry it with us and actually buy it on the trail so right. that was that was our plan <laughs> Well, did you have moments where the, the kids got discouraged and they, they wanted to stop, or were they just pretty much gung-ho the whole way? Um, I think the time that Hazel was saying about earlier, when we left the campsite at Miller Rocky and we were headed up to Rower Den and where we only did four miles in a base, or three, three or four miles in six hours, 
was to be honest I, I said to hazel at the time i said i think maybe we should book into this hotel for the night and reassess because isaac really wasn't going anywhere yeah, he wasn't enjoying it at all no. either he was just dragging his little toes <laughs> no so we bribed him with a can of coca-cola and then he ran for the next sort of six miles <laughs> <laughs> So that that was it, it, some of it got quite tough towards the end of the day when we were doing more miles and they had to keep going. Um, but yeah, we found if if we if we were up and away from our camp the night before, we we'd probably get you know we we wanted to try and do it at least eight miles a day, and if if we could do six by lunchtime by getting up and away, that that was great because then we could be looking for a camp or at a campsite by half past four five o'clock in yeah. the evening and then that gives the kids time to play or gives us time to sort out dinner but it was those days where we might not have left camp until nine nine thirty in the morning and then we were still hiking it half past six seven o'clock and it's try, trying to get dark that's when the kids spirits would drop a little bit but every single evening it didn't matter where we were they still had more energy it's like people we met along the trail they'd overtake us and then we'd catch them up eventually and we'd get to a, a campsite and if it had a play park the kids would be in the play park right like running around just being kids noisy active kids that you wouldn't think had walked like 12 miles that day they just loved it they, they weren't exhausted they were they still had well, I remember being a kid, and I, I'm sure you do too, that it was all about movement. And so even if you're not backpacking, you're going to be moving all day. And so kids put a lot of miles on their feet every day. I think the challenge is to say we're going to walk down this trail, and we're trying to get from here to here. And sometimes I think that's when the children are kind of like, eh, because it's not play then. <laughs> it can turn into work, right? Oh, they, they always had fun. Um, doing it, and um, the kids have got great imaginations. I mean, sometimes... we went under an underpass at Cree and Marrick, yeah. and um, Lily and Isaac decided that that was a, a um, underpass that they used in one of the Harry Potter films. So they decided that they were going to play Harry Potter under this underpass, and um, so they were casting spells at each other. <laughs> and then, and then for the next eight eight miles, miles all Harry we had Potter. was these two kiddies playing Harry Potter along us. Uh, or we made up disgusting flavours of ice cream one mm-hmm. time, didn't we? But there's always there's always some game to play. Oh, and the the passports, of course, you could go to the next place to get your passport stamped, and then the the entire way is marked with thistles um, as way markers, so you could always spot the thistles. And then there was we would meet the same people uh, again and again as they overtook us or we overtook them. So there was always uh, interesting people for them to chat to. Oh, so fun. They, they yeah, it, it was great as well because if they did have the energy and if they were keen, they could run on ahead. And we kind of had a system in place where if they couldn't see us, they would wait at the next way marker, you know, for us to catch up or at least be in sight before they ran on again. And they were quite good at that. Um, apart from one time, Isaac decided to go exploring in the woods. Oh, so he, <laughs> yeah, he, 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 again, Isaac's our youngest one, and he was behind me and I could hear him and then I couldn't hear him and I turned around and he was gone so Hazel took the other two children on and I went to find him and literally within two minutes he had just disappeared into this thick pine uh, or spruce plantation it was and I couldn't find him and I was shouting and shouting and when I hike with the kids I wear this really fluorescent orange uh, base day glow day glow t-shirt <laughs> base, base layer t-shirt just so they can see me and it helps at night as well. Um, but yeah, after about 10 minutes of shouting, he uh, pushes his way through the trees. He goes, oh, there you are, Daddy. And I said, well, we were looking for you. We've been looking for ages. Where have you been? We thought you were you got lost. I didn't get lost, Daddy. I was exploring. If I was lost, I would have sat down and blown my whistle. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. You know, I uh, wanted to mention to the listeners, there's something that happens with children And not all kids are like this, but when children get away from the adults and then the adults are yelling for the children, some children are afraid that they're going to be in trouble, so they'll actually hide. And I just wanted to bring that up. That wasn't your experience with Isaac, but I wanted to bring that up because it's really important when you're hiking with children 
to explain that scenario to them and let them know Mm -hmm. that if they lose their way, that they're not going to be in trouble, but that they should make sure that they respond if they hear someone calling for them and what you had already taught him to do, sit down and blow the whistle. I mean, that's, that's wonderful. So I just wanted to mention that for other parents out there. Um, sometimes children will hide just because of their concern that they might get in trouble. I think that's true. I mean, you've got to, we always explain to them. Yeah, we don't have too many rules when we're hiking, just that if we shout at them to come to us, they have to come to us. That's, that's the main one. What, you know, And it's usually just for their safety more than anything else. And, if they, and the other one is if they can't see us, they stop and if they're on the trail, that they stop and wait for us to catch up. Right. You know, I have to mention also, if uh, a family is hiking in Colorado or maybe on the Pacific Crest Trail, um, there are mountain lions. And uh, for some reason, mountain lions think that smaller children are fair game. And I know that sounds tragic, but we have (laughs) lost several children in Colorado over the last several years. So, Yeah, we're fortunate we don't have mountain lions. (laughs) (laughs) Right. (laughs) When in places like that, then it's important for the kids to be close to an adult. And Mm -hmm. it's just for that reason. But when you're in Scotland, I don't think that's a problem. So that's wonderful that you could do it that way. Yeah, I think the only thing we have to worry about over here is adders or vipers is the same snake with a different name um if they were to bite you you might need a trip to the hospital but it certainly wouldn't kill you they're quite rare though and they're very rare and very shy they're very shy and you could probably walk past them and not even know they were there they'd run away from or slide away from you before the the, um the old lady on the train when we, we first arrived in scotland did warn us about the notorious haggis that we had to look out for the haggis what is this the haggis i, I believe it's completely fictional but she spent ages <laughs> telling, telling lily that she had to look out for the wee haggis <laughs> no well the, well the haggis is a local delicacy in scotland and it's made well i won't go into what it's made of it's uh it's it, it generally mutton and vegetables and other unidentifiable pieces of meat um served up in a like a big sausage case if you like um but the Scots like to tease the rest of us about them roaming the hills and the glens up, up in Scotland. <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> That's fun. Well, what advice would you have, Robert and Hazel too, but I'll start with Robert. Robert, what advice would you have for families who want to start hiking with their children? Not sure if the kids are big enough yet, that sort of thing. Um, well, I think for us, we did that little trip up Snowdon, and that just showed us that we just always underestimate both how capable and adaptable the children can be. And if we give them that opportunity, they, they, they never stop surprising us. Mm. So try it, you know, go for a, a shorter day hike. You know, if, if, if you think, or oh, they can, they can probably do two or three miles, make it five, but be prepared to bail it for. Right. So have an out. What would you say, Hazel? I think that, if you involve the children in the planning or give them some sort of responsibility, because we're always like Team Jones and everybody has to carry that bit of kit and everybody knows where they're going and they've got their own snacks that they can snack on as they go. I think if you, if you involve them in that, then they're more likely to want to do the, see the point of the walk. Right. Yeah. And that's, want to get to the end. But, but it's so much fun just to be able to spend that time with them. And are having nothing else to interrupt you. Yeah, because when you, if you have a, a weekend at home, you've always got to pop to the shop and get the groceries or run errands, and you don't have that consistent block of time. Whereas at Easter on the West Highland Way, I had 14 days with the children, uninterrupted. Every minute of those 14 days, I could see the children. Oh, and that just nice. doesn't that just doesn't happen at home. It was lovely, even all piling into that tiny little tent together. Even when it got really cold, and you were using the children as your blanket, it was still it was still fun. Yeah, the five together. of us pile into a very small three man tent because it's the only one we can get to fit in the backpack, <laughs> it's and it's light enough. So it, it it's kind of a elbows and knees to make a bit of space on the floor, but we all fit in there, and it's lovely and warm. So oh, that's fun, and the kids had to just love that. Yeah. Um, yeah. What about the pace? Because, you know, adult hikers have different paces and, and we sort out how we're going to walk. But children, um, to keep up with an adult pace, they're moving at twice the speed. 
right? Mm -hmm. So how did you manage how fast you would go? Really, um, Isaac really set the pace. Yeah, and we sort of really set the pace of the youngest, the youngest one. one. And it was mostly, apart from when it got too flat for him, it was really fast. Especially, what was the hill we went up? Up Conic Hill. With the lizard. He ran up this hill. It was massive. And he ran the whole way up. Wow. I mean, people were giving him high fives. <laughs> and then he ran all the way down it. We were like running after him going, this is lovely. Um, to see I mean, me? <laughs> at, the end of the day, at the end of the day, we're hiking together we don't want to be strung out across um, you know half a mile all five of us or one one of us at the back with the children while i'm striding on ahead so yeah we make sure we have plenty of breaks and then we've got we plenty keep... of time to do the hike in and yeah I, I mean the guidebook i've just got it here but it says you know six six days to do the west island way uh, you know if a, a healthy fit adult well we doubled. We, we we did it in nine with a rest day. I, we probably wouldn't have been able to do it any quicker, but it might have been nice to do it a bit slower, to be honest, just to have a bit more time in the hills. It, we ended up with a day and a half in Fort William before we had to get our train. And rather than hang around in town, I would much rather have been back up on the trail than in the mountains. Right. It's really quite mag magical about just being on the trail, especially some stretches of it that were just, just, just no one else around, just just you mm -hmm. and, and that's another benefit of hiking with the kids is that if you're on a popular trail all, all the uh, all the grown-ups if you like they hike on past you and they're, they're away in the distance so if you if you're all leaving at eight o'clock in the morning it's not long before you've got the trail to yourself yeah that's kind of a fun idea too i hadn't thought of that Hey guys, this is Travis. I'd like to talk for a moment about Kind Snacks. Kind recently became a sponsor of the Adventure Sports Podcast, and we are stoked to have them with us because Kurt and I were Kind customers long before they became sponsors of the show. We truly do buy Kind bars to throw in our hydration packs for a mountain bike ride or our backpacks when we're out on the trail. We grab Kind Snacks instead of others because we can actually pronounce the ingredients on the back of the package, and they all taste awesome. You guys need to take advantage of the deal they're giving our listeners. Simply go to kindsnacks.com slash adventure to get a 10-bar sampler case for just 10 bucks. Think about it. That's only a dollar a bar. Then because we know you're going to love them and you're going to go back for your second order, Kind is going to give you your $10 back by discounting your second order. That's a no-brainer, so don't wait. Go get your 10-bar sampler case now. Go to kindsnacks.com slash adventure. All right, I'll let Kurt get back into the interview. Guys, don't wait. Go check out that deal. By now you certainly know who Bent Gate is. That's for a great reason. Bent Gate Mountaineering has been sponsoring the Adventure Sports Podcast almost from the beginning, and we really appreciate that. They've made it possible for all the great shows to continue coming your way. We want to say thanks by reminding you to go to them for your backcountry gear. If you live in Colorado, then just stop by their store in Golden. If not, go to bentgate.com. They have what you need from the latest ultralight gear to the tried and true classics for climbing, hiking, and camping, like Arcteryx, Hilleberg, Nemo, Western Mountaineering, and many more. Need advice? They have you covered there, too. Their staff are passionate adventurers who can offer help from their own experiences. Bentgate also hosts lots of events and speakers. Check out their website to see the schedule and to see all of their products. Help take care of the Adventure Sports Podcast by getting your gear from Bentgate Mountaineering. What do you think is really important about hiking and backpacking with children that may not be so obvious? Something that you learned on this trip that you'd like to share? I think I'd just like to reiterate what I was saying earlier, that we never give them enough credit for how capable and adaptable they are. Every time we've been out with them on whatever trip, they've always surprised us. That's fun. So what, what do you guys have planned for the future with the kids? More hiking like this? Um, not so many big trips like that coming up in the next few months. Uh, next weekend, me and Evan are going to the New Forest. We're doing a small 30, oh, no, it's 40-mile pilgrimage. 
We, I'm picking him up from school on Friday. We're going to get the bus to the ferry terminal. We're going to get the ferry across the water. And then we're going to hike through the New Forest National Park to Salisbury Cathedral, which is the biggest church spire in the UK. Um, and then at the end of end of July, we're going up to the Brecon Beacons National Park. And I found us a little 30-mile round trip that we'll probably do over two or three days, probably for three and a bit days, to be honest. And that takes in some of the bigger mountains in the southern UK. And then we got Isaac's birthday, of course, he wants to yeah. go. Up Isaac's the birthday. Isaac's birthday is actually the day after mine, and he's decided that we're going mountain climbing for our birthdays. So we're going <laughs> to head up to uh, Snowdonia yeah. in North Wales, and that's where some of the bigger mountains outside of Scotland are. Um, and then maybe in October, we're going to try and walk around this little island that we call home. There's a coastal footpath that runs for about 80 miles all the way around the Isle of Wight wow. and we can basically we can walk out of our front door uh there's a, a different footpath which takes us up the river to the coast and then we can walk around that nice. and then next year we're probably looking to go a little bit further afield so we haven't got many plans to catch no. <laughs> just, just I love the itinerary that is wonderful <laughs> um, so, so, so so that's for, for, for this year probably next year we're planning a well tentatively planning a big trip to Norway um we can it's cheaper for us to get the train from the UK up to Norway than it is to fly with all the children um but we can get the train to Boda uh, which is a few hundred miles inside the Arctic Circle so we can do some Arctic camping with the children in the summertime obviously right I love it so I this brings up a wonderful question for me I on the Adventure Sports Podcast we do an awful lot to encourage people to go out and, and connect with nature to find a an adventure sport that they love to get more fit and to let the sport be the motivation for living a bigger life, a better life. And we really believe that that works. And I think it's wonderful that you're introducing your children, especially at these ages, to that spirit of adventure. So tell us about the value of that for your family. Well, I've got a little list here of all the different adventure sports that we've done in the last 18 months to two years, if I can give that to you. And then maybe Hazel would like to address your question. Sure, you bet. So in living on an island, obviously we have access to the, the seaside most of the most of the year. It gets a bit cold from no, sure, November yeah. through. If you're going to go in the water. Yeah. yeah. But in, anyway, the uh, in the last 18 months or so, we have done bodyboarding, stand-up paddle boarding, sea kayaking, coast steering, uh, and then we get back on dry land. We've done hiking, biking, camping, orienteering, slacklining, mountain boarding, and we've been and played on the climbing wall as well. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So what were your children's favorites on that list? Um, Evan really enjoyed the mountain boarding. That was a like a taster session we did for his birthday last year. There was Lil's favorite biking, although bikes don't like her and they always break whenever she's on one. She lost the pedal last time, <laughs> didn't yeah. she? Yeah. always Isaac really enjoyed the slack line at the moment we bought one for Christmas for them and we just go up to the woods and it's and string it up between two trees and it's on his bucket list that he just did at school what he's going to do in the summer holidays so uh, yeah slack Isaac really enjoyed slack lining his teacher yeah. had to google it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well that's wonderful I love it so Hazel what do you what do you say about adventure and children I think if you're giving them the spirit of adventure when they're this young, then they will carry that for life. And as parents, like, what better thing could you do for your, your children? And being outside in nature, just everything just makes much more sense. I mean, when you're not, you did everything, you're bombarded constantly by information and things. And it's just, you know, it just when you slow down, you can really appreciate your, your children for who they are it's just when you're in nature it just seems you just automatically seem to be better people mm, i love that have you heard of what has been termed the nature deficit disorder oh no that sounds dreadful is that children that don't don't see dirt yes oh. yes exactly oh. it's it's been identified and and as, as an actual type of an illness even that children that don't get to connect with nature and have the adventures that your children are having um, end up 
with all sorts of uh, side effects that are, you know, not not pleasant, not good things. Um, and especially, I think, when children spend all of their time connected to a screen of some sort, they don't have the same context for reality, and nor do they have the physical health, nor do they have this wealth of memories and experiences with their parents that you're providing for your kids. And so it's become a thing that, uh, you know, authorities are warning families against. Watch out for this. You've got to get your kids out into nature. Yeah, we've actually got a bit of a system for dealing with screen time. Um, We're getting a bit fed up with the children constantly asking if they could, you know, go on the computer or play on the Xbox or whatever it would be. Um, So we devised this voucher system. Uh, So every month they trade in a voucher for an hour's worth of screen time or gaming time, if you like. Um, it's their Christmas present. It was their yeah, Christmas they, present. They Christmas and so w- once a month, they get an hour where they can play on the computer games or the video games, whatever it might be. Outside of that, they don't even ask anymore. Wow. They're too busy. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I love it. I, I think it's so important, especially for uh, families that are raising children in the city. You know, it's just a little bit harder um, to make sure the kids don't spend all of their time indoors and that they do get out to the local park or, you know, on a hike or something. It's just so beneficial to the family. And, and especially what you were saying, Robert, about the the chance to actually get uninterrupted time with your family. You know, how rare is that and how priceless is that, you know, making those memories and, and having that interaction. Good for you guys. Oh, Thank you very much. Thanks, Scott. <laughs> Thank you. Well, how about a final story? We're, we've kind of run out of time here, but do you have a final story you'd like to share about um, something that just was amazing that happened on this trip? Ooh, what do you want to pick? Um, I've got quite a funny story from before we had the children, but I'm not that, sure if... Uh... No, that's, that's not a, a final story. <laughs> <laughs> that's not that amusing. Um, what do you reckon? Um... There's a good story from, uh, it's not from this trip, I'm sorry, but when uh, we went up Mount Snowden the very first time, so Isaac's four, and he's wearing his Batman leggings, which are Lycra leggings, and they're covered in the uh, Batman insignia, you know, much like Adam West from the 60s show. Sure. And and uh, we were about three, two thirds, three quarters of the way up, and uh, this chap comes down and he was a, he was an American guy. I won't do the accent. Oh, he I said, think you do it so well. <laughs> he, he said uh, he said to Isaac, "Hey, you must be a really excellent hiker if you've got Batman on your pants." To which Isaac turned around and said, "They're not pants. They're leggings." <laughs> and then proceeded to climb on up the hill, running up. It's so funny. Oh, uh, what a delight to have children and get to enjoy you know, some of your own passions with your children. I, when we first started having kids, I confess, I felt it a little confining. You know, I loved having mm-hmm. our children, but I, I was like, whoa, all the stuff I used to do, there's not as much time now. And, and it was a, a challenge, but that's a short season. And then before long, they're large enough, big enough, strong enough to start doing the things, you know, that you love to do together as a family. And then I found that I enjoyed skiing more than ever. I enjoyed hiking more than ever. I enjoyed biking more than ever because I was able to do it with my own kids and enjoy the discovery that they were yes. having about each of the sports, you know. And so it's I encourage families. Yeah. yeah, it there's a season where it's a little bit more challenging when they're really little, but that's okay. Cherish that time and it won't be long at all until you'll be having even more fun than before. So yeah, and also as they get bigger, they can carry more stuff for you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, do more more chores, more washing up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and we um, we inspired people to start families. There, yeah, there was there, one Emma, the French girl, and then there was that other. There was a German chap we met on the trail, and I was chatting to him for a little while, and he said, uh, "Do you know?" Uh, I was thinking about settling down and starting a family, but then I wouldn't be able to go off traveling and having these these adventures. But today I've seen you guys on the trail and I think, yeah, maybe I can have both. To which I thought, I think you might need a girlfriend first, mate. But <laughs> thank you for the sentiment. 
<laughs> oh, that's cool. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Robert and Hazel, and also Evan and Lil and Isaac. But thank you for taking the time to share your adventurous lifestyle with us, and especially this wonderful um, backpacking trip on the West Highland Way. I love it. We appreciate your time and, and all the stories that you shared. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Ed. Yeah, it's our pleasure. And for all of you listeners out there, man, if you have a family, it's time. Start doing those fun things together. Until the next show, remember, get out there and have some fun. Hey, before we sign off, I wanted to give Justin at OutdoorVeteran.com a shout out. He put us on his list of top 20 outdoor podcasts you should listen to. So we wanted to give him a yell. If you guys like the Adventure Sports Podcast, I think you'll also like Outdoor Veteran. It's got a lot of adventure-related information on it for you to check out. And I'm sure you can find a couple other shows in that podcast list to enjoy. So thank you, Justin. We appreciate it, bud. On Thursday's episode, Kurt will be talking with Bowen Dwelly about a new sport for our show, and that's long-distance kite surfing. It's going to be cool, so don't miss it. Until then, get out and have some fun.